So I take advantage of this moment to introduce uh, Daniele Elmini. He's from the Politecnico of Milan, Italy. He's presenting work on neurophobic computing with emerging memory devices. Let me summarize his uh, CV. Daniele is a full professor at the Politecnico of Milan, where he got also the PhD. His research interests include, among others, the modeling of characterization of non volatile memories. He is associate editor of IEEE Transactional Nanotechnology and Semiconductor Science and uh, is senior member of IEEE, as far as I remember. He was recognized as a highly cited researcher by Thomas Reuters, received an Intel Outstanding Research Award, and recently he got an ERC Conciliator Grant. Thank you to be here, and we are looking forward to, to your presentation. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you very much for your introduction, and thank you for, to the organizer for inviting me to Barcelona <coughs> to give this talk today. I will uh, <coughs> actually, uh, I'm afraid I will change a little bit the, 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 the topic uh, with respect to the previous speakers and I guess the, the whole conference because I will talk about the neuromorphic computing with emerging memory devices. So we're moving a little bit from the software level and very conceptual level of artificial intelligence. Uh, to the uh, real hardware that is behind the and, and, uh, uh, processor, or a microprocessor, or a neuromorphic processor, or whatever it, it is that actually uh, uh, computes with electrons in order to provide uh, the certain functionality that you're looking for in terms of artificial intelligence. So, and today um, I will try to convince you that uh, we need a specialized hardware. So mm -hmm. everybody is playing with uh, uh, top-of-the-shelf uh, uh, computers like uh, CPUs and GPUs to perform, uh, uh, to, to, to get a certain performance and functionality. I'll try to convince you that actually we need a certain change of paradigm and introduce new devices and new uh, structures and new architectures in order to um, uh, um, uh, scale down and uh, scale up the, the functionality and uh, and the, uh, the powerful of uh, uh, powerness of the uh, artificial intelligence. So uh, this is the uh, outline of my talk, and I will first make an introduction again, <coughs> trying to address why we need uh, uh, a new hardware for arti artificial intelligence. And then I will uh, 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 um, uh, move into the details of uh, the, what is called RAM here. RAM is a new memory, emerging memory, and I will give you a little bit of the <coughs> Um, um, concepts about this new device. Um, uh, we are actually using uh, RAM to develop synapses and networks, and I will show you three uh, uh, toy examples or three toy problems about uh, why we can use RAM synapses in order to expedite uh, uh, artificial intelligence. Uh, and then I will draw my conclusions. So, first introduction. Uh, maybe you're familiar, of course, with uh, deep learning. Recently, there has been a lot of uh, improvement and uh, um, um, uh, good achievements by deep learning. For instance, there is a very good uh, status about recognizing images and giving captions so the system can recognize, for instance, a woman that is throwing a frisbee in a park or a dog uh, uh, here. And this is the basis for the uh, car, uh, autonomous cars, which uh, where the camera needs to be able to recognize images and to distinguish between cars and pedestrians and other objects in the, in the frame. And of course, you've heard about the uh, deep learning being able also to, uh, uh, to play Go and to beat the uh, world champions of Go, thanks to learning here. Uh, the reinforcement learning allowed the machine to play games and game after game the, 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 the machine was able to, to, to be uh, even better than the, uh, the world champion. So this is very great achievements. Uh, but all these achievements have been made possible by CMOS scaling. So these concepts, many of these concepts were actually developed back in the 80s or the 90s. Uh, you wonder why uh, we had to wait so much time to, to, to see real, something real achieved by these uh, systems. And the reason is that only recently uh, the new machines have been uh, 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 available that can deal with such a complexity of many, many uh, parameters and many uh, very large databases and so on. So CMOS scaling, CMOS is of course the complementary metal oxide semiconductor, is a transistor basically, transistor scaling 
is behind, is the key enabler for this technology to be developed. So, uh, but when we talk about tr uh, transistor scaling, we're talking about mostly about the increase of the frequency so that you can speed up the computation uh, a lot uh, by decreasing the size of the transistor. And here you can see, <coughs> this has been taken by a, a, a paper, a famous paper by IBM. Uh, it's a True North paper here. Uh, that when you increase the frequency of the computer, you're also increasing the power density. And here you can see all the microprocessors in the history, basically. Back in the 1971, this is the 4004, which is the very first uh, uh, microprocessor that was developed by Intel. And moving up in, uh, in, uh, along the time axis, and also the frequency was increasing and the power density was increasing. And if you look carefully, there has been a saturation recently because you're not able to increase the scaling uh, of the frequency because the power density is becoming too, too large. And you, you cannot uh, just uh, um, uh, evacuate all the power dissipation, all the heat that is consumed within the chip. So this is uh, the heat wall, so-called heat wall, where you cannot increase the, power, the, the, the frequency, uh, increase uh, uh, without uh, damaging your chip. So this is uh, the first limitation of the scaling. The second limitation of the scaling is shown here. It's called me memory wall. So all the computers nowadays are built uh, with the uh, concept of the von Neumann architecture, where you have a CPU, which is a basic uh, processing unit, and you have a memory. And especially for data-intensive uh, uh, computing, which, for instance, deep learning is one example, you have to move a lot of data from the memory to the processing for the processing to take place. And all the input must go through this, through this bus and all the output must go back to the memory and so on. So this takes a lot of time, a lot of energy, and this is why this architecture is not efficient. Um, uh, um, it's not efficient. So going forward, we need a new architecture which is similar to the brain. And interestingly, if you look at the brain, where it is sitting here, at very low frequency and very low power consumption, but still the brain, our brain, is very effective and very efficient in doing a lot of computation much better than uh, many machines nowadays. So um, because in the brain there is no separation, there's no computer and memory, but everything is all together, like the synapses is doing both the memory and the computation. So we need something, you know, as I told you before, we need a change of paradigm. We have to move for, uh, uh, closer to the brain in the hardware. So we need to develop a new uh, so-called uh, uh, in-memory computer. What does it mean? We need to compute within the memory. And this means several different uh, things. Uh, for instance, uh, deep learning, okay, you can develop deep learning. For instance, IBM is very active in this uh, uh, frame where they try to use a new kind of memory, which is so, uh, called the phase change memory, to uh, implement synaptic weights and to uh, compute within the, within the memory. Uh, but also uh, in-memory logic, you can do logic computation within the memory. You can do stochastic um, uh, computing and you can do uh, uh, data security, for instance, or chip authentication through the stochastic uh, computing within this uh, uh, new memory, some kind of memory that I will show you later. Uh, and of course, brain-inspired neurocomputing or neuro neuromorphic processors within uh, uh, the memory. And uh, there's a lot of technology, architecture, and device uh, uh, um, uh, research going on to develop <laughs> these uh, this, uh, new, uh, new systems. Uh, so let me talk a little bit about the brain-inspired neurocomputer now to, uh, to, to focus the attention on the how we can develop uh, uh, spiky neural networks for uh, neuromorphic computing. Uh, within the memory, and if we, if we talk about the memory, uh, we actually have to uh, uh, discuss what is the best memory to achieve a certain computation. And here I'm, I'm showing, this is taken from a recent uh, a review paper in uh, Nature Electronics, here I'm, I'm showing uh, four types of emerging, so-called emerging semiconductor memories. They're all non-volatile memory, which means that once you, uh, once you uh, write your state or erase your state, uh, that will uh, remain there forever, basically, or for at least 10 years at relatively low temperature. <coughs> Uh, and this is the same as the uh, uh, long-term memory in the brain. So this is one uh, uh, a feature that you need to actually have on board. Uh, here I'm showing four types of memory. The first one is the resistive switching memory. 
uh, phase change memory, uh, magnetic memory, and ferroelectric memory. I'm not going into the details of all this memory, but they're all good to uh, um, um, develop uh, some kind of uh, neuromorphic function, either the synaptic function or the neuron function or other function as well. Uh, let me um, give you some more details about the RAM, the resistive switching memory that is shown here. This RAM is basically a very simple device, which is uh, a dielectric within two electrodes. So it's like a capacitor, if you remember from the textbooks in the high school or in, in, in the university. So here the capacitor is actually broken down uh, so that you develop some filamentary switch in here, filamentary path. And um, this is the IV curve which measures the current when you apply a certain voltage and you will notice that if you apply a voltage, a positive <coughs> voltage that exceeds a certain threshold, the device can switch from the high resistance state to the low resistance state. So moving from a low conductance to the high conductance if you exceed a certain threshold. And this is because you are actually inducing a movement of a, a defects within the, within the half pneumoxide, which is the dielectric here. So this is interesting because you, you can actually potentiate a synapse here, for instance. You can uh, uh, connect, uh, you can increase the con connectivity between two neurons uh, just by exceeding this threshold here. And you can also uh, apply a positive, uh, uh, the op opposite voltage, so the negative voltage in this case, to retract the filament back to the top electrode and switch back from a low resistance state to the high resistance state. So this is a good memory device, and this memory is actually being uh, used by several uh, industries, such as TSMC, uh, 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 Intel, IBM as well, and many others, to, uh, um, to store the data with a very high uh, uh, density. But here we're not dealing with memory, and uh, this kind of uh, digital application is not interesting for us. Today, we're actually dealing with synapses and networks, and we, I would like to show you what do we need from this device now to develop some kind of neuromorphic function, and what we need is actually, um, if we want to develop a brain-inspired neuromorphic computing, we want to be able to have a device that can learn as the synaptic, learn, the synaptic connections learn in our brain. And one example, there are many, there's a lot of discussion, of course, in the neuroscience uh, community about what is the real mechanism, what is the uh, mechanism for learning within the brain. There's a lot of chemistry and physics involved here, but from the phenomenological point of view, uh, uh, the most popular mechanism is, is the so-called spike time independent plasticity or STDP where the timing between the spikes is actually controlling how the uh, uh, learning takes place within the, 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 synap the, the synapse. So this synaptic <coughs> plasticity which is the capability to change from a low uh, weight to the high weight within the network. So basically it works like this. You have a neuron here which is the so-called presynaptic neuron and this is the synapse which is connecting this presynaptic neuron to the postsynaptic neuron. And let's assume that the first spike, the presynaptic spike, is uh, taking place before the postsynaptic spike. In this case, there's some, some kind of causal relationship between the presynaptic spike and the postsynaptic spike. And the, um, the, the, this will induce a change in the synaptic weight to increase the synaptic weight. On the opposite side, if the postsynaptic spike is taking place before the presynaptic spike, then in that case, this is an anti causal relationship and the uh, synaptic weight will actually decrease. So this is a long-term depression in this case and a long-term potentiation for the delay. So the delay here between the spikes is actually controlling how the synapse is, is going to change uh, during this interaction between the spikes. And this is exactly uh, uh, what happens within the brain. This is uh, uh, some data taken in, uh, uh, in, uh, in vivo, actually, in the hippocampus, which shows that you have potentiation, long-term potentiation for positive delay and long-term depression for negative delay. Um, so we want to develop this kind of uh, functionality within our, our RAM synapse. And uh, maybe this is a little bit too complicated. I'm not sure you're, you're familiar with circuits. Uh, maybe I can just give you some highlight here. This is the RAM device, okay? And this is connecting the presynaptic neuron to the postsynaptic neuron as, as shown before in the conceptual slide. But this is just uh, done by transistor, just one transistor and one RAM device here. 
where the presynaptic spike is inducing a current, a little bit of a spiking current, going into the postsynaptic neuron. And this postsynaptic neuron in this implementation is uh, acting as an uh, integrated and fire neuron. So it's going to integrate all these spikes coming not only from this neuron but also other neurons and spike after spike it will lead to threshold and the threshold it will send a spike back to the to the postsynaptic to the to the synapse here at, at some point you will have overlap between the presynaptic spike and the postsynaptic spike and based on the delay you see we have designed the postsynaptic spike with two spikes one is positive one is negative so that depending on the delay uh, and the overlap between the two spikes, you might have either potentiation or depression. In this case, the, the, the delay is negative and there is overlap between uh, 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 the presynaptic spike and the negative poles in the postsynaptic spike. In this case, there will be uh, depression because you remember when I showed you the IV curve, if you apply a negative voltage, it will induce uh, 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 depression or the, the change from the low resistance state to the high resistance state. On the other hand, if the uh, delay is positive, <coughs> which means that the presynaptic spike is coming before the postsynaptic spike, then you will have an uh, overlap along the positive spike, and this positive spike will induce potentiation. So you can achieve, uh, um, in, uh, in a hardware, in a very small synaptic uh, uh, connection, which is just one transistor and one resistive memory, you can achieve STDP, the spike time independent plasticity, which is observed in the brain. So this is our STDP in the device. It looks a little bit like square uh, shape. Uh, don't worry, you, you don't really need to uh, uh, elaborate the shape and get the exponential shape that is ob observed in the biology. What is really needed is just that you have potentiation for positive spike and depression for negative spike. So now the question is what do you do with this very simple STDP block here? And the answer is that uh, we came out with some networks, very conceptual level, very small implementations, uh, let's say uh, toy problems. And one of the problems that we want to, wanted to solve with this STDP is the pattern recognition within a network, neural network, uh, like a perceptual network, very simple one layer network. And then we also have come out with a spatial temporal learning uh, of sequences based on the same STDP concept and the same type of device and also hope field network uh, is an example of a recurrent network uh, using also this STDP uh, concept and some other digital uh, implementation that I'm not going to talk here today. So let me start with the, with the feed forward network which is basically a perceptron, very simple perceptron as you can see here, it's a one layer uh, 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 perceptron with one postsynaptic neuron and a presynaptic, several presynaptic neurons here. This is the physical implementation where we uh, put everything in the hardware, uh, and these are the RAM uh, synapses here, connected to a microcontroller. Here, this is Arduino to uh, play the role of the neurons, presynaptic neuron and postsynaptic integrated and fine neurons. And I'm going to show you some results here um, uh, to show you that, the, that the actually STDP is uh, enabling learning at a very conceptual and very simple level. But so these are the um, um, input pattern that we provide and it's going to be a diagonal pattern that we show to the, uh, to the network and the network of synapses will adjust to the input. So without having to uh, write individually all the memory devices, you just submit your uh, <coughs> input, which is a diagonal here, intermixed with some noise. And you're going to see very quickly <coughs> that your synaptic waves will adapt to the, to, the, to the pattern. So this is, again, very uh, simple, you know, uh, self-learning uh, uh, mechanism process taking place within the system without having to just uh, program individually all the devices. You just provide the pattern and the system will learn in an uh, unsupervised learning way, which is exactly what happens in our brain. So we believe that there is something really relevant with the biological uh, uh, learning here. 
Uh, so we also changed a little bit. We, we, we play some trick with the, with the system. We initially, initially we, 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 we prepare all the synaptic weights in a different way, such as you were, you have been uh, um, uh, looking to s some other object and you have uh, memorized another object. And now I'm showing you a, a, a new pattern, which is a diagonal. And I want to see if you can forget the previous one, the previous picture and learn a new one. And this is the, the old one, old picture, the previous picture. Now, again, I'm submitting the diagonal, as shown here. And very quickly, the system can learn uh, self, uh, uh, self-learning uh, mechanism, again, taking place here in the, in the synaptic network. So we also changed the, the, the memory device just to uh, make sure that uh, this system is, is very universal. You can apply the same uh, 1T1R concept with using RRUN devices or using any other kind of similar, similar device, emerging device, non-volatile memory. This is, in this case, we use a phase change memory, which is uh, the, for those of you who are familiar with the 3D cross-point technology by Intel and Micron, is exactly the same memory that is being used in this 3D uh, uh, new memory, 3D cross-point new memory. So again, here we uh, submitted uh, uh, an X, and this is the pattern, and these are the synaptic weights, and we uh, uh, were, uh, uh, we were uh, successful in, in uh, uh, making this synaptic uh, uh, pattern, uh, uh, synaptic uh, network, being able to learn the, uh, the, the pattern. So let me switch gear now and talk about the recurrent networks, which, which is probably more similar to what happens in the brain, because the brain is not simple fit for one network much, uh, more frequently you find recurrent networks and recurrent networks or re of recurrent networks and so on. So recurrent, uh, the most typical recurrent network that we consider here is the whole field network, which is uh, in this implementation, it, you just have six neurons uh, uh, talking to each other and you can have synaptic uh, connections between every one of these neurons. And the way we arrange a uh, whole field network using this 1T1R synapses is something like this. You can see all the neurons are sitting on the column, and these are all the synapses here. And you can, you can see a blue synapses and red synapses is because we have, for each connection, we have an excitatory synapse and an inhibitory synapse. To, uh, the excitatory synapse is sending a positive current to the other neuron, and the inhibitory current, uh, inhibitory synapse is going to send a, a ne negative current to inhibit the, uh, the, the other neuron. So for instance, take this connection here. This will connect neuron three to neuron two. So neuron three is sending some uh, spike, pressing at this spike, exciting the current to flow, positive current or negative current to flow to the neuron N2. And of course, there will also be a connection between neuron two and neuron three, where neuron two is controlling and dictating the current to be sent to neuron three. So this is uh, how we implement the whole field network shown here. But what is interesting here is that we can achieve the so-called Hebbian learning, where the neurons that fire together wire together. So the idea is that, is that if neuron three and neuron two are active at the same time, because for instance, they're being excited by the uh, similar sensory um, information, such as the Pavlov dog is looking to the food and also um, uh, uh, sensing the smell of the food, for instance, uh, then these neurons are firing together. Uh, and the, uh, correspondingly, the neurons are wiring together, which means that if you have spikes taking place at both neuron three and neuron two, and this will induce, because of the overlap between the spike, the temporal correlation between the spikes, this will induce potentiation of the excitatory current and inhibition or depression of the inhibitory current. And this will increase the connect connection between these two neurons. And the, um, so we have experimentally, of uh, first the simulation uh, uh, demonstration here, where we have these uh, six neurons uh, 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 recurrent network, where we first excite the first three neurons to form the so-called attractor. This is basically to excite three neurons at the same time, and these three neurons, because they are firing together, they will also wire together, which means that these connections here will be uh, improved and, and potentiated. And then we move to the next three neurons, four, five, six, and we also develop this attractor. Attractor means that actually if uh, once, once we form the attractor, then I 
uh, excite just one of the neurons within the attractor, I will also be able to wake up all the other neurons, such as the Pavlov dog is, uh, for instance, smelling the food, it can also uh, uh, revive the uh, idea of the food altogether. Um, so this is shown here, actually, that the recall of the attractor here, um, uh, we uh, have um, uh, uh, induced some uh, stimula stimulated one of, just one of the neuron, and as you can see, we have uh, uh, waken all the uh, three neurons. And then we moved to another neuron, just one neuron was, uh, uh, was uh, stimulated externally and we were able to activate all the attractors. So, so this is basic, you know, uh, uh, dynamics of the Hopefield network, but we were able to um, develop these within a, a, a RAM uh, synaptic network uh, uh, in, the, in, the, in the architecture that I showed you before. Uh, so this is again the, the same, to, uh, same concept of, as the Pavlov dog. So let's assume that the three, uh, the three uh, neurons were activated all together, which is the bell, the uh, 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 salivation and the food, and then you just need to uh, ring the bell and the uh, concept of the food will wake up in the mind of the, of the Pavlov's dog. So this is an, uh, an example of associative memory or associative learning within, the, uh, within hardware, basically. And we have developed this, uh, this in hardware. The previous one that I showed you was simulation, and this is real hardware that you can see here. And in this case, we use phase change memory, which is as, as, uh, what I showed you before, uh, a flavor, basically a flavor of resistive switch in memory. And here you can see uh, uh, forming the attractor first. The, the, the three neurons here are wiring, firing together and wiring together, and then we move to neurons four, five, six that are also wiring together and firing together. This shows the excitatory weights and inhibitory weights in time, showing a potentiation of the excitatory weights and inhibition or depression of the inhibitory weights. And then we also r uh, were able to recall the attractor, uh, as in the Pavlov dog example. Okay, so this outfield network is really exciting. Now we are playing more toy problems, uh, playing with more toy problems and trying to solve uh, 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 a constraint satisfaction problem. It turns out that you can actually use this same concept to, for instance, uh, solve a Sudoku or solve a traveling salesman problem uh, to, to, uh, to solve a, a generic uh, traveling, uh, uh, constraint satisfaction problem. Now, the uh, final uh, uh, a slide that I want to show you is another problem uh, that we um, that we addressed uh, is the spatial temporal network. Why spatial temporal network? Actually, uh, the previous concepts were actually static, which means that I show a picture and this picture is not moving; it's just staying there. But actually, in the world, uh, most sensory information are actually time dependent. So, for instance, the speech is changing with time, and also music and gesture and also motor control, everything is moving with time and, there are, and spatial temporal networks and spatial temporal patterns are involved here. So we have to figure out a way to use this same spike time independent plasticity to be able to learn and then recognize sequences, for instance. And for that, we took inspiration from the biology. Um, uh, it has been recently shown that orientation detectivity in the eye takes place by spatial temporal concept uh, 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 shown here, let's assume that you have two receptive fields here, one is low and one is fast, and if the point or the object is moving this way, it will excite first the, the slow uh, uh, receptive field and then the fast receptive fields, and overall the summation of these stimuli, stimuli will actually result in, a, in a, an overall signal that will uh, uh, be over the threshold. Whereas if the direction is the opposite, as shown here, this will induce the uh, first, the, the fast uh, receptive field and then the slow receptive field to react. And overall, the summation of these uh, spikes will not be enough to reach the threshold. So in this case, just by uh, uh, summing the uh, time evolution of, the, uh, of different receptive fields with different time response, you can detect the, the, the direction in this case, which is a certain example, like just, just recognition, for instance, or direction sensitivity. And here we've done something similar, where instead of uh, changing the speed of the receptive field, we change the amplitude of the receptive field. So let's assume that you want to recognize this sequence of the three neurons firing like one, two, three. We want to recognize sequence one, two, three. And let's assume that this 
sequence is actually uh, uh, learned by the amplitude of the synaptic weight here. So that the first synaptic weight is smaller, is relatively small, the last one is larger. So you are translating the sequence, the time of the sequence into amplitude of the synaptic weight. And in this case, if this happens, then you can, the, the, the sequence one, two, three will result in an overall post-synaptic post potential which ex exceeds the threshold, so you can detect one, two, three. But on the other hand, if you uh, submit another wrong sequence like uh, three, two, one, you will not be able to reach the threshold. So in this case, by correlating the timing of this within the sequence to the amplitude of the weights, you can uh, recognize sequences learn and recognize sequences. So this is the basic concept and this was implemented in uh, uh, synaptic networks using our run devices. And in this case we, uh, we had a sequence, we, we wanted to develop a system that can recognize uh, uh, sequences of four spikes, uh, like in this case one, four, nine, sixteen. So we have sixteen neurons firing with certain sequences and we wanted to train uh, the system in a way that only the sequence 14916 was uh, um, uh, retained and recognized by the system. And first of all, we've made some training, and the training, I'll, go you, I'll show you a little bit more details later, but the training is a supervised training where we send several different sequences, and any time the sequence is, is right or wrong, is true or false sequence, we send some information, some label to the system. So this is kind of supervised learning, and eventually, if you look at the final, these are the weights in color, in a color map, eventually the sequence 14916 is marked by weights which are large and with the same sequence, with the same uh, correlation because I told you uh, the, the first one should be small, the last one should be large and all the other weights should be small and uh, uh, negligible. And this is exactly what you get in the, in the end, in, in initially you started with just random weights, but the system, thanks to uh, uh, supervised learning, was able to, uh, to learn during the presentation of all the possibilities, possible sequences, and finally learn. Uh, and actually this um, uh, uh, learning was actually uh, being possible by the spike time independent plasticity, once again. So the timing of the, of the spike was dictating the uh, potentiation. So in, for instance, if the timing delay is relatively short, thanks to this exponentially decreasing uh, 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 presynaptic spike here, the, if the timing, is, timing delay is short, then the potentiation is relatively large because there is overlap between one, rel one spike and one relatively large voltage here. And in this case, we can make, uh, uh, so the overall uh, overall overlap between the two spikes is a strong potentiation. Instead, if the timing is, if the timing delay is longer, the overlap is, uh, is weaker and the potentiation is weaker as shown here. So we are able in hardware, uh, very simply by overlapping two, sh two spikes with different shapes, we are able to translate time into amplitude of the weights. Again, so this shows again the synaptic weights as a function of delay and this is one example of synaptic, uh, of spike time independent plasticity. And finally, we tested the uh, accuracy of the system and we showed that actually the uh, uh, sequence 14916, which is sitting here, was uh, successfully detected. So once every time we now send the 14916 sequence, the system, the, the overall uh, post spike potential can uh, overcome the threshold and it is uh, recognize the other, on the other hand, a full sequence cannot just make it to the threshold. You might notice that actually there is a bunch of sequences that are false but are actually also make it to the, to the threshold. Maybe let's assume that instead of 14916 you sub submit 19416 which is very similar to the other. So the system is not really capable of uh, discriminating between the two of them. So uh, this will also be uh, 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 retained and so this is why the full sequences are not strongly rejected in this case. So uh, uh, this is actually uh, 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 also can be viewed as a, as a, as a, on, a let's say on a positive side, uh, as, a, as a tolerance of the system. So the system is tolerant to errors and this is exactly what happens in the brain. If you have wrong sequences in your 
in, uh, in what you're reading here, you can still be able to, uh, you're still able to read, okay? If, the, if, for instance, in this text, every word, pretty much all, all the words are misspelled, but you can still read the text, which means that your brain is, is, is uh, error tolerant and also our system works error tolerant. So this, the weak rejection of full sequences is not uh, uh, all that negative in the end. Okay, so that was my first slide. I want to draw my conclusion, and my final bottom line is that the AI hardware with RAM synapses, which is known for Neumann, takes advantage of this non-volatile memory, which is small and scalable and very low energy, uh, and so on, might pave the way to the brain on a chip. If we are looking into the long term to uh, uh, real uh, spiking networks that can mimic the brain, of course, probably not the human brain, but very small brain, like the bee brain or the mosquito brain or something like that, maybe this is the good direction to go to, uh, to, 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 again, to change the paradigm, to compute in the memory and uh, take advantage of these new memory devices that are available. And I showed you three toy problems and how we solve it. And of course, these are, are small, relatively small and conceptual, but they might also be scaled up to a larger complexity. And last but not least, I'll let me also mention all the work done by my students uh, that are shown here and all the sponsors. And thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Daniela, and I'm looking forward to be not old enough to see Dubai uh, computer according to the number of synapses that are on the motherboard rather than on <laughs> the memory. It will take time, yeah. It course, will yeah. take time, yeah, thank you. Um, questions? Yeah. Yeah, I can listen, yeah. Yeah, okay. Um, so I saw the toy examples. What I mean, okay, yeah, now. Um, so the toy problems you brought, um, in the classical deep learning, there is the first hello world example, the MNIST data set. Uh, you know that, right? Like the, the handwritten digits, uh, 28 pixel by 28 pixel. Just your guess how, what would it take to get there to, for, to let this hardware recognize the digits? Well, we actually have, have done it not in, uh, not in real hardware. So there is no experiment for the MNIST, not yet, okay? But we have done it by simulation and there is a paper, I can show you, I can send you the paper if you want, where we address this problem and this, which is also a toy problem if you want because a very small, complexity, but it's still, still you know, uh, support the capability to uh, uh, recognize in patterns. And we, we made it with pretty good, uh, 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 pretty good resolution using spiking neural networks and STDP. So totally different uh, frame compared to the deep learning, but there is a back propagation, for instance, scheme and supervised learning. So just by uh, unsupervised learning, we can, we can make it to, um, learn and recognize the um, images within the amnist. Yeah. Thank you. If, if, if I may, I got a second one. Um, so you said you do not think maybe a um, brain of a bee can be on a chip, but not a human brain. So what is the physical limitation why, yeah, looking in the future, right? Brain of a bee is not there yet too. So why not human brain? Well, I think we, uh, the, the discussion might be become really long. You know, there's a human brain project going on uh, at the time. I'm not involved in this project. But when I, when I talk to people involved in this project, the, it really comes, it really looks like there is total, uh, total lack of understanding of how the brain works. And even, even small pieces of the brain, the human brain, the human brain is the most complex machine in the, in the world, okay? Not understood yet. And probably there are people that say, probably in, even in the hum, human history, in the future, it is possible that we will, not, we will never get to the point where we can state we have understood the brain, how the brain works. This is really a grand challenge for, for humanity, I guess. So one, one problem is uh, human brain is com, com, very complex and very large. So there are uh, uh, so many synapses, so many neurons. But and it, it, is, it is not understood, 
Okay, so uh, you cannot you cannot really it's not serious to say we we are going to build a computer a human brain in in a computer human brain on a chip. Although you might eventually, thanks to the scaling down, thanks to new devices, thanks to uh, uh, improvement in lithography and so on, you can think that you, 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 you can really mimic the same architecture and the same connectivity and the same number of neurons and synapses within a chip. But then what to do with that? It will probably be you know, a waste of time because you don't, you don't know what kind of uh, operating system, what kind of mechanism uh, you have to you have to adopt to make it work. So I think this is real grand challenge. So probably what I see feasible right now is that we can probably uh, 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 target very small brains and uh, not not the whole brain, but only just few features of the brain, such as I don't know the motor. Uh, uh, motor, uh, sensory motor system in the bee, for instance, or uh, object detection and uh, navigation of, of the end, for instance, something like that. So very simple brains and very simple functions that might be feasible and doable, I think, in the, uh, uh, I don't know, 10 years or something like that. Fascinating. Thanks, you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Hendrik? Uh, Thank you very much. A wonderful talk. Um, just a quick question. Have you done any sort of comparison between the toy examples you've given and a classical similar example, so to understand how much you have gained in energy saving or in time, etc.? Is there a comparison? Yeah. So, very good question. Actually, if you look around, there will be, I mentioned the Human Brain Project, uh, there are at least a couple of examples there, uh, the Brain Skills uh, uh, chip uh, uh, by University of Heidelberg and the Spinnaker by University of Manchester. And there are many, so many others, okay, examples of like True North by IBM and so on. So many examples of com uh, uh, spiking neural networks and non phone Neumann computers um, uh, uh, to develop uh, to simulate or to realize uh, uh, brain computation or cognitive functions, uh, but they're all CMOS, so strictly CMOS architecture, which means CMOS technology, which means that they're just using top of the shelf transistors, diodes, capacitors, and so on. So if you look at, the, um, at, at their structures, they're very interesting, and we would like to get to the same uh, complexity, but they're just using transistor, which means that they are somehow limited in the in the, in the functionality and uh, in the, uh, in the uh, also the density that they can achieve. The transistor is much bigger. Or if you want to develop a synapse like this that can develop STDP, uh, you come out with a circuit that is very complex and takes a lot of area on the silicon. So um, we believe that actually these new memories are essential if you want to save area, save energy, and save complexity. Uh, in the system. And you do not have, also you do not have, um, uh, unless you use flash memories, which is complicated for other reasons, and one is the voltage and also the uh, uh, size and so on, you do not have non-volatile memories within uh, CMOS uh, transistors. You are going to only have SRAM or, D or DRAM, but they are volatile memories. But memory stores or these new memories, they can also provide non-volatile, capability to store non-volatile synaptic weights, for instance, and so on. So I think that the, uh, these emerging memories are really the key to, uh, to, to be able to scale, it, to scale down complexity because they also can feature some, some physics that is very similar to the brain. Um, so they can uh, reduce the complexity of the system thanks to their physics. Thank you. Some over there. Hey, uh, great presentation, thank you. So uh, how will you address the problem of uh, changes in the architecture? So for example, in case of uh, software cores, it's actually fairly simple to add a gate or to change the wiring model in the architectures. And in these physical devices, uh, th it will be a problem, right? So how will you address this particular issue? Uh, good question. I am not sh really sure I got your question, but I think so, there is a lot of reconfigurability and a lot of uh, 
room to change the architecture. The, okay. The, the okay, I mean, if I may add. So, for example, you have showed us an example of the RNN architecture. So one of the variant of RNN is their uh, LSTM architectures. And in LSTM, it's, it's not just one single memory model. There are like multiple gates, input gate, forget gate, and everything. So um, will you be adding multiple different semiconductor devices there just for, uh, just for this particular configuration? Or will it be modular enough so that we can actually change it later? Um. Yeah, not really sure about the question again, but I think that uh, you can uh, you can design your system. I mean that the problem to configure your system is the same that you have in a CMOS. Okay, in a CMOS case, you have LSTM or you have any kind of STDP synapse and so on that you can you can replace the CMOS gate. Okay, such as assume that you have an LSTM block mm -hmm. with the CMOS architecture, you can replace it with an LSTM block with the same function but very s s smaller space, smaller area and using these RRAM devices. These RRAM devices will, s will be integrated in the circuit mm -hmm. so you can make all the CMOS hybrid, the so-called hybrid technology mm -hmm. using CMOS technology and RRAM devices or phase change memory devices, anything, but they will be integrated. So I think that it's something that you add, but you will not miss in any of the reconfigurability or the flexibility that you have in the CMOS uh, world. Okay, thank you. I hope, and hope one, I ask okay, you. and one more small question. So, um, in the in the way this uh, research is going, are you trying to develop a dedicated computer system just for the artificial intelligence, or as a peripheral device that can be replaced for the uh, GPU accelerations that we have right now? No, I think that uh, we're really targeting something different, which is the known form and architecture. I think that if you want to replace the GPU with something similar using memory state devices or phase change memory and so on, it will not make any sense because we are just trying to do the same with different devices, uh, but it, uh, they're not these, these devices are not designed to, to work as a transistor. Okay, so they, they do not have the, the speed, they do not have the low energy consumption just to work as a digital key. So I mentioned that there is some work done in the in-memory in computing trying to develop in-memory logic. Okay, I really do not think, frankly, that this is uh, really interesting because cycling and energy consumption and so on will not make it really interesting. But if you take advantage of the device physics in our RAM to replace or to, uh, to design, like uh, I've, I've shown here, the uh, RAM synapses or RAM neurons and so on. It turns out you can, you can save a lot of energy and lots of space in the, in, in the chip. So we're not competing directly with GPUs, mm -hmm. uh, but trying to do something totally different. Okay. 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 Uh, one more question. Last question, because we have to go to lunch, otherwise Thank get you for late the talk. Uh, you're saying uh, in-memory computing uh, saves time uh, or saves energy, yeah? but uh, I think there could be an, uh, uh, a greater uh, impact uh, for in-memory uh, computing, uh, because if it is a database, memory is your database, and you change one value, you don't have to do anything more. Normally, you have to read it out, you have to change it, and you have to put it back, and you have to look at the behavior. But if you, uh, I want to say, if you have an in-memory computing, you have an, uh, a kind of filter for, do I do this computing, or do I have to change it, or do I, uh, so the, the input is the result and the behavior at the same time. So it could, that could be the reason for this big uh, change in energy management. Yeah? yeah, I totally agree with you, yeah. If you compute within the memory, you don't have to move the data from the memory to the processor. But the, the memory is already, I mean, computation is already in situ, done in situ within the memory. So mm -hmm. if you change just one bit, you will just, you know, process the data within the memory and you will f sense it already. I mean, there's no, there's no need to... Yeah. But to I, I want to go further that the behavior or the computing task you would, you change in the database one entry. And, uh, uh, and then you have to read it out and then you have to 
uh, look what the behavior change so the operating system has to do with this database and has no consequences. But if you change in an in-memory, uh, everything is done. So the behavior is automatically uh, included, implicit. Yeah? So it will, uh, this is what uh, animals do. They, they change the memory and then they have a new behavior without thinking about it. Yeah, so. yeah. very interesting comment. Yeah, thank you. Okay, thank you very much. And now we can go to lunch and the thank you to Daniele to, for the hardware inside of AI. Thank you.